recording. Okay. Hey, so good evening, guys. Uh, we are going to be covering chapter six and seven. And I think I have an older version of R for data science because in that it was chapter five. So uh, in any case, we are doing scripts and EDA. There is not a whole lot to be said about scripts. I think we are fairly familiar, but then for whatever it's worth, you want to start up a new script. Here's the drill, control shift N opens up a new script. And then you can you can you can do whatever you want. One plus two and two plus three. And then on my Windows machine, if I do Control Shift Enter, it ex executes all of them. So if you want to make sure that you're not whatever you type into the into the console, if you want it to be saved in some form, it makes sense to move it to a script, and you don't have to do it um, line by line. You can just do them all together by using Control uh, Shift Enter on a Windows machine. So. I don't have anything else to say there because I think it's fairly um, not fairly intuitive. So I'm going to ju jump right in into the chapter, which uh, we have a fair amount of ground to cover. So um, the outline of this is basically um, we are going to be talking about variation within variables. And in this case, we are referring to a variable, which is basically something for which we are collecting values, the value, which is actually what we have collected for that particular variable. An observation or a record, which could be a collection of multiple variables, and typically in the tidyverse, you would have one observation, and the tabular data set, which is basically the whole uh, a bunch, a whole number of observations with a lot of variables. So we are going to be covering different aspects here. One is what is your variation between different variables, and uh, what what is um, so what, what is the variation within one variable, like across multiple measurements? And what is the variation between different variables? And what, or what is a co-variation between different variables? So two different aspects here. And we're going to be figuring out how to visualize these, um, these variations appropriately. So when we talk about variation, um, we are going to start with the classic bar chart versus histogram and why we would choose one over the other. And I think it's fairly obvious here that we have, um, we have a categorical variable on the x-axis and we have uh, for, the, uh, for the graph on the left and we are basically measuring the count. And what you have on the, and these are all discrete, right? So like you can see that fair, good, very good, et cetera, they're discrete groupings. There's, no, there's nothing continuously linking them. So a bar chart would typically be used in that case where you, you don't have any continuous aspect to your x-axis. And on the right where you have carrot, you can see that we've used a histogram and we have actually binned it. <clears throat> so when we bin it, we, we get this, uh, this continuous looking graph, which is called a histogram. And again, on the y-axis, we are collecting the counts. And the counts can, it, it doesn't have to be counts. You could use different options and you can um, also get other count, uh, other, um, um, you could also have different things on your y-axis in addition to just the count for, for the histogram, but we'll get into that in a bit. So if you had to play around with the pin bit, like um, it's a little small here, but basically what you're looking at is a bin bit of 0.51 and 1.5, you can see that you start to lose um, the granularity uh, in the graph all the way to the right. Whereas on the left, you can see a little bit more defined features and how the, you know, how the distribution of your, uh, of the carrot, uh, the count of the carrots is across the different uh, levels of carrot. So if you did play around with this, the best way to do it is to just try it out with a few and see which one gives you the maximum um, uh, resolution. And you can see as many uh, of your counts as possible. So if you had to focus further into your carrot, so like so far we have been looking at all of the different carrot, uh, carrot levels available in the diamond data set. Here we are gonna drill down and only get those which are between zero and three. And you can see that a pattern starts to emerge. Um, the, the ones which are better defined are ones which are like round, round numbers. So like, I, I think you, you can see it's almost like a, it, it goes up and comes down and goes up and comes down. And if you actually do the counts, you'll find that the ones which are like zero or 0.5 or like one or 1.5 tend, uh, tend to have larger numbers for some, for, for some reason. Maybe that's how it works in, in, in the dying world. But um, so, 
so a great way to do this is to just quickly figure out like how you want to even see this. If you want to do a frequency count or if you're wanting to look at continuous variables, establish that and then filter further to see if you can start to see a pattern emerge. So this would be like maybe the very first thing that we would do to, to just get, get our hands dirty with the data. So uh, filter it down to a smaller set. And then we start getting into this whole business of outliers. So with the diamond data set, you can see that between the X and Y axis, like there's a large amount of the X axis, which is not covered because of the fact that you have like this really ginormous Y axis going on. So one way to see what's, what's happening there, because right now you're not able to see what's happening at the lower counts because of the fact that there's 12,000 on your Y axis and it's, it's just zooming everything out. So zoom in a little bit, reduce the, the, your, the, the limit on your Y axis and you can start to see that you have some weird looking outliers that are sticking out here like at, at zero at about 30 and about 60. So what's going on there? And what, what I say by why, I know that that's a bit non-intuitive but actually the diamond data set has three columns which are called X, Y, and Z, which are actually the length, width, and depth. So even though it's completely confusing to see Y on your X axis, what I'm actually looking at here is one of um, either the length, width, or depth, and actually you don't know which one it is because it's not labeled. So that's one of the exercises to actually figure out which one we could be looking at. So Y is one of the dimensions of the diamond, but I just don't know what it is. But you can start, suffice to say, you can start to see these little bars like showing up when you are closer in, when you're zooming in, which you would not see if you were looking at it a bird's eye uh, view. So let's um, look, look at some of the exercises. I didn't have the time to get into all of them, but just like a few which I thought would drive home the points that uh, Harvey was making in the subject matter is right here. So if, if, if you use YLIM, um, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the Cord Cartesian and XLIM and YLIM, but they're kind of um, pretty awesome in, in a sense because who, um, they will actually enable you to focus. And I have a feeling that I have a typo in this. I should probably be using Cord Cartesian because um, not sure if you guys know of XLIM and YLIM, but they completely eliminate um, that they, those data points, and I'm not sure if you want that to happen. The sport Cartesian actually zooms in. So this might be a typo. I might have to go back and check. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to, to stop me and ask. Um, when you also bin it differently, so the first one is 0.5, the second one is 1, and the third one is 1.5, you start to see that there's a little bit of like, and you can see clearer here, this, this is like larger, this is 50 and 100. You see that there's a little bit of a break right here, like in your price between um, zero and 2,500. And it's, I'm not really sure, maybe there's data missing for that particular uh, price, uh, price point or the market crashed and everything. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting, but it, it seems like there's, there's like a huge, uh, there's like a, a gap between uh, those two, the left and the right side of that graph. So these kinds of patterns start to emerge when I guess you zoom in and zoom out and, and you change the bin width if you're working with, uh, with, with, a, with a histogram. And um, you could also alternatively, if you wanted to just do a simple count, you could start to see that, hey, where are the maximum numbers of my diamond, uh, where the carat numbers of the diamond being, um, being found and, and you can see that your 1.001 has the maximum number and the others are, I mean like 0 0.99 is, is, is pretty low and all the others are, but the biggest uh, numbers here look like it's one and 1.01. Of course, there's another, there's 167 more rows and I haven't ordered it. So I'm not sure if that's the maximum, but in this particular snapshot, it, it, those, those are the maximum counts of numbers that you have. So it doesn't have to be just graphing. You could also just do straight counts and, and get a feel for you know, what you're looking at. So um, if, yeah, so now here, now here we're talking about what's going on between core Cartesian and XLIM and YLIM. So when you actually do, um, so on the left, it's core Cartesian. And on the right, you actually, you're, we are looking at um, XM and YLM. And what happens is that for the one on the left, 
we just zoom in and we are looking at it, but the one on the right, we have actually removed out all the data that corresponds to those points. Not sure if this is very clear. This did not end up looking as clear as I wanted. So are there any questions here? Because I'm, I'm a little bit confused looking at this right now. Um, let's see, there is housing. So I should have put my little code stub in here. Um, we can go back to that. Um, container. So what I might do is go back to, um, maybe to my, and just pull up the, Let's see what's going on here. So, so here, yeah. Um, the first one is actually the core Cartesian, and the second one is the Xlim Ylim. So I apologize. So the first one was a core Cartesian. So here we are just literally just zooming in into um, uh, your X being between zero to 3000 and your Y between zero to 500. So X is between zero to 3000 and Y is between zero to 500. So you're, you're, you're just like literally like, like a microscope, you're focusing in on that. Whereas here it has dropped all your values post that point. So you don't have any data that exists beyond 500 and beyond 3000. This is something I think not a lot of people know of because they kind of tend to use Quad Cartesian and Xlim and Ylim interchangeably, but they're really not the same because one helps you focus and the other one actually gets those data points out. So what you're looking at is only what you have defined in your upper and in your in your lower and upper bounds. So um, <clears throat> the, um, so and here again we get into what what's going on between a bar plot and histogram. So if you are missing values in a bar plot, and this will be um, clear actually, so, yeah. So this, uh, uh, what, what is the difference between a bar plot and a histogram is that in, uh, in a histogram, you, you, if you have any values missing, then it will actually take it out. Whereas in a bar plot, it, you, it would still be included in, in the bar plot. And I'm not sure if I'm saying this the opposite actually. I think in a histogram, because it's continuous, if, actually I might need to go back and take a look. So the first one is a histogram, the second one is a bar, and uh, let's just take a quick look at this. And what you get with this is that with, with a bar plot or with a histogram, let's see, does it actually, so it does remove the rows which have non-finite values. So all the ones which have NA, which are three in number, it removes those rows for a histogram. And in a bar plot, it actually, I think, includes those. Okay, yeah, so that's right. So you still have NA here, but in a histogram, it would remove anything where it's not available. So that's, um, that's the primary difference here between the bar plot and the histogram. So now, so I, I don't know if it was clear so far that we were basically trying to look at how the measurements can vary within the same variables. Was, was that clear to you guys? Or did I like run through it so fast that you didn't actually get the nuance of that? Okay, so here we get into covariation, which I think is, is really more interesting because here we actually look at how two variables can vary together or they can, um, you know, like how, 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 how they can impact each other. So here we are again looking at, um, we are looking at one categorical and one continuous. So your price is your continuous. And here, this is the cut, which is categorical. This is your price, just, just two different ways of representing the same thing uh, when you have a categorical and a continuous is you could do it doing a by by this, which is like, a, I think it's, it's, not a, um, it's not a histogram, but it's a poly, it's called a poly, what is something, um, uh, what is it called? It's, it's, it's a histogram, but with 
but it's like almost like a line graph, but it's basically representing the same thing that a histogram would. But you can actually see where your different groupings are. So here you see that they they are they are basically segregated based on the cut. And what you have here is the count, and this is your price. And here you have your cut here, and then the price, and and this is um, this is a histogram. That's uh, this is a box plot that's ordered by um, the, by increasing values of the median uh, price. So this is one good way to actually figure out what's going on here. So, um, sorry, one second. I think they're called lower smoker. The you mean this kind of a curve is called the lowest of the smoker? Is is that what you're saying? Okay. All right. So um, the polygon. Okay, that's right. So that was a geom polygon, and we. Um, and we are call, and and this this sort of uh, I guess the smoothing function or something is what what Gwen was referring to, is is the lowest uh, method. So um, I think it's it's kind of interesting that you can see the medians varying here, and then you you can see the outliers, and of course the risk curve goes right up to the 1.5 times of the interquartile. So this is one way to look at how um, a categorical and continuous. So he, here's where I had like the maximum number of questions and I don't think I, I really dwelled on this enough. Can, is there any how that you guys can look at this and, and, and figure out which one impacts one more than the other? Okay, admittedly this, we are looking only at one categorical and one continuous, but then I'll bring up the next slide which should have a different set of variables. So how do you know which one impacts one more if they trend together. So looking at this, what would you think? Um, how do you think price and, and, and cut track together? Like, do you, do you see anything which could be a potential relationship here? Or like, are they in any way closely, are they co correlated? To me, okay, I'll, I'll go first. To me, it seems like though it's to me it was interesting that even though the cuts can be premium or good the price is actually pretty low like that was a bit of uh, that, that kind of surprised me a lot that you know the fair ones actually tend to be pricier than the uh, almost on par with premium and actually more expensive than the very good so an ideal was actually like lower than the rest so i'm not sure what the difference between ideal and very good or premium are is, but that was a little bit curious to me, right? So what I wanted to, wanted to have you guys take a look at is if you can look at these, I've tried to track a bunch of different variables together so we can actually start to see if we can see which variables track together. So here, what we are looking at is price and cut. So do keep that in mind. And let's, um, let's just go ahead and take a look at so uh, this is just the same thing all over again, the price and the cut. And here we are looking at cut and the color, right? So we are looking at cut and color. And actually, I, sh I hope I have one where I'm looking at color and price because price, I think, is the ultimate outcome variable that you want to, do, that you want to be looking at. So the, the size of your, the dots here would represent how close those two variables are in terms of how closely they are either coming up together or how many, like how strong, I don't know if I would go as far as to say how strong the relationship, but definitely how, how, how much they are represented together. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, but it appears that in the case of ideal at least, we do have, um, you know, the, the, the cut, uh, ideal cut and the color, like they seem to have, you know, some, something going on there. So this is cut and color, correct? And they are both categorical. So this has already given you some idea that, like, would you call this a strong sense of tracking between cut and color? I would say maybe not. Does anyone have anything else to say about this? My takeaway would from this would be like where um, the the diamonds co-occur within color and cut. So the bigger in that particular. Right. 
But so in terms wait, of just it, the way these two is n, n what does n stand for? I mean, n for me is always a count variable. Is that not right or no? Yeah, that's right. It's the count. Is, oh, okay. Thank you. I just wasn't clear. Yeah. Um, so to me, this looks like okay. It, it doesn't stand out like in my mind as something which you know I should be considering in terms of how cut and color like just as two covariates they they don't really stand out together like by you know maybe in and of themselves but together they don't really stand out that is here oh sorry um let me just go back that is here when i look at cut and price again i i don't know if you know i'm well the naive view would be to look at the medians that median bar and just see if there's any trend and you and so from this, you'd say, oh, well, it looks like the worst cut, you can expect a higher price. So that'd be a bit of a red flag. But you could kind of look at the height of the bar, at the, the medians. But it's not giving you any sense of volume. And I think that's where- That's true. Well, you're absolutely right. And we will address that uh, because a box plot by default, it's the same size regardless of how many you have there. But apparently, the box plot does have a particular variable that you can set to actually see the size. And I think I might just jump ahead there so that because of that, uh, this particular one. So the one to the right, you can actually set uh, a particular characteristic in your box plot where you can see this being um, related to <clears throat> the number of observations. So now, in other words, you, you know that uh, this particular one for your character, where it's probably like 2.3 five or like maybe 2.25 it has the maximum count here so anyway that, I'm, I'm jumping ahead i'll um, we'll get back to this in, in just a bit but just to go back yeah so so this is between two categorical variables and this is between two continuous variables where we are looking at the carrot and the price. And this is apparently a little bit better than um, a scatter plot. It's a different kind of plot called a hex. Um, I might have to go back here again. It's, um, yeah, so they, they, they're called the geome bind, bind two or geome two, two D, bind 2D and geom hex. And apparently it's, it's a bit of a time save relative to the scatter plot. Cause literally what this is, is a scatter plot. You're trying to look at two categorical variables, but it saves time if your data set is fairly large or like one plots it uh, in terms of uh, this, this is more like, a, uh, like a rectangle and this is more like hexagonal. And apparently that's, it's, it's, it's something better to use when your data set is fairly large. But this is starting to look pretty, Pretty good to me right so like you can tell now that between your carrot and price like there is like there is a certain amount of uh, uh, the, it, it, they definitely look correlated to me so i don't know about the cut and and the price like uh, sorry this is the color i think what i forgot to do is actually map um, map cut, uh, cut and price and see how that looked and i think that's that's my that's a mistake I made. I, I did not plot cut and price together to see if there is um, any sort of a correlation there. So I apologize. I, I, I forgot to do that. Um, but this is starting to look good, right? So now we can tell carrot and price are definitely that they, they do seem to be correlated. And so if carrot and price are correlated, there are different ways to look at it. You can also put it into a box plot where you treat one like a bin variable so even though carrot is continuous you can bin it and say that you want to assign bins to each level here in the carrots between zero and three and you would basically treat this as a categorical variable and you would get you would get this relationship and 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 i think you you can you can start to see that this is looking very very correlated right like it's um, and especially something like this, where now you can even see relative numbers and you can see the trend between carrot and price, like you were almost plotting two continuous variables. So I thought 
this was really neat because it um, it it treats it like uh, a continuous, and and you can actually even see the frequency of uh, of numbers here. So I um, I like this a lot, where they pin a continuous variable and they look at it. So I would definitely say that between pies and carrot, yeah, def that they are correlated, but between price and color, like I'm gonna go back again. Um, price and color, we have cut and color, we have price and color, and I don't know, I'm not so sure. The only thing that's missing here is price and cut, and I am sorry I did not do that because I think that would have given us something, that would have given us something really inf information, uh, good information to have, but whatever, so. Here's another way that you could do this. So if you did use xlim and ylim again, and if you, if, you, if you plotted this, so what we're looking at here are the other two characteristics of your um, diamonds. So this is your length and width or length and depth. Like it's, I don't know what X, Y, and Z stand for. By zooming, on, zooming in on specific areas and like leaving out the ones where you're seeing some strangeness, you can actually start to see a pattern emerge. Like this is not so implicit if you just use, and, and the code for this is, is right here, where to get this, I'm actually using an xlim and ylim, and you will recall that an xlim and ylim will get rid of data points. So it doesn't just zoom in, it gets rid of data points outside of the upper and lower bound. So it's core Cartesian is enabling us to focus in on this, but what the XLIM and YLIM are doing on the inside is actually throwing out those data points and helping us get, and I think this, you know, um, this is between two continuous variables, X and Y, which are length and width or length and depth. And we can see that there is a strong, um, a very strong correlation here, right? Does, does anyone have any questions about this? I know it's confusing that it's called X and Y, but they did not get into any greater depth as to what those two um, variables stand for. And the, and the next um, graph I think is, is really very, very powerful. So what they are saying here is that they have already established that price and your, and the carrot, uh, the, number, the, the number of carrots, they are correlated, but they are not able to see it in and of themselves because according to them, the price and cut are also strongly correlated. And this is something I actually failed to plot here. I should have done it, but I'm thinking that if we had plotted price on the Y and cut on the X and X, uh, and of course the cut is a categorical variable, I'm thinking that we would have seen something, uh, we would have seen a pretty strong relationship uh, emerge. So I do apologize, I did not complete the story uh, we have only seen the price and carrot. We have seen a strong relationship there. But if had we seen price and cut, we would have actually realized why they have done this here. So what Hadley says here is that it's hard for him to figure out um, if the price is being impacted by the cut or if it's being impacted by the carrot, uh, by, by, the, by the number of carrots, because of the fact that they both strongly trend with the price. So one suggestion is what you could do is that you first establish a model where you're using price with the carrot. The carrot here is continuous, of course. And so this becomes a straight linear uh, relationship. And you would, uh, he's using a log scale for this. He gets the residuals. So basically what he's doing is he's subtracting out the impact of carrot on the price, getting the residual plot from that right? And then once he gets a residual plot, which is this, which is, this is basically your residuals on your Y, and this is your carrot, carrot the number of carrots on, on your X. He then uses the same residual to plot it with the cut, right? Um, so I think the last one is actually something that's of maximum interest to me. And that's because it's actually um, telling us how we can remove the effect of one strongly correlated variable and then just see the other strongly correlated variable in and of itself 
without the impact of um, the, uh, the other variables. So this, like I said, this was the code. So what you would do first is that you would take, get, extract the residuals, and then that is basically your model alone without the other explanatory variable. And then you would use your residuals with the one that you thought could also have a, a strong relationship. And you would, um, you would plot your, your graph like this. So I'm not sure if this is telling us anything because I don't have the graph uh, before I extracted all the residuals uh, between the price and the cut. So I don't know if this is uh, this, if you guys are able to interpret it in any, any other way. Like my interpretation is that because I do not know how cut and price track together without extracting the residual aspect, I don't know if this improved it or if it, gave, if it gave me any more information, but feel free to jump in. I, I just have a quick question um, on the coding, um, which yeah. is, do you have any ideas why he would do a log transformation on the carrot and the price? Was there any indication of that? Well, I can see why he would do it on the price, but you're right, that threw, that threw me in for a loop as well as to why, because if you look at, look at the shape of this it's like it's 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 got a really weird shape like if anyone has seen residuals versus fitted like you know that it's supposed to look really random it's not supposed to have a u curve u shaped curve either trending up or trending down so i no i don't and i don't know if this is commonplace to do it with this particular kind of um yeah actually your guess is as good as mine i i don't know why he did that like and if, if you want to extract out residuals, if this is something you always have to do, like trans, log, log transform it, I, I don't know that actually. Hmm. So, but it's definitely interesting. Like I think, um, I'm not sure if this gave me any more information than I had before, but it's definitely a technique that I did not know existed. So I think here, since uh, Eric, you know the most stats, at least, I mean, definitely more than um, I, I do. When you subtract out residuals, you are effectively taking away the, the whatever effects that particular variable here had. Like that's, that's what you're subtracting out and what you're getting is essentially an intercept only model at this point. Is that, is my understanding correct? Yeah, pretty much. It's effectively like, what's the average price if I just know the carrot and this is a carrot that was the one right yeah so if I just know the carrot what do I expect the average price to be and then how does that compare the residual is how it compares to the actual price um, so the expected price based on carrot compared to the actual price is your residual and then when you're plotting the residual on top of carrot you can see that um, how far how far off you were from the actual so it's uh -huh that you do poorly the lower the carrot um i think was the uh, residual plot right can you click on the residual plot again right so the lower the carrot the worse the um prediction you know you overshot um or you undershot no overshot price by quite a bit there right oh because you have to be asked there's, no, there's another um there's something else at play that we would need to pull in to get a better understanding of what's going on with uh, price. All right. So what is your baseline here? Like what, what, what is the baseline that's about which this residual is? I mean, like, I guess I, I mean, I understand it conceptually. I just don't understand it uh, in terms of the statistics, like what, 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 what have we done exactly? And what have we, what have we subtracted and what, what and when we plot residual here versus the cut like are we only looking at price without the impact of carrot on it and if so why does this look so weird well i'm surprised the residuals are all positive because usually um you expect them to range yeah. from zero it's because the log i would think uh, right? that's true you can't have a negative that's true you're right because it's a log yeah maybe that's why actually that's that's a very good observation maybe that's why it's a log because you can't do well, negative I, I don't know because you're taking the residual off of the predicted um price from the model itself so once you're taking the residual i don't think it matters that it, you 
predicted on log on log scale. Let's see. So if you're logging, you're getting... so if you take that model and you did like augment, right, and you returned um, the data set with the actuals, with the um, predicted values, with the residuals, the fact that you've taken a, you've used a, a log re-expression in your model doesn't Im Impact how the residuals look. You'd still well. The thing though is the residuals is actually an exponent of the residuals. So actually, yeah. oh getting, yeah, why are we doing yeah. that? Back the, yeah. Okay. Oh, I guess that's yeah. it. Yeah. Good yeah. Kind of. Because so, because the residuals always are supposed to be on the actual scale, and true. not on the log scale. I think yes. So I wonder why he converts it into a log first to to get the model though. That's kind of. I mean, I don't know why he would do that. Um, I don't know. Please send your questions and hate mail to F Hadley Wicked on Twitter. Think, well, the thing is, I think we need to look up what ad underscore residuals is doing because I think that's coming from um, this package. Modeler. Called, yeah, I, I think I would need to look up, look up that package. I, I just didn't have the time to do that. Uh, but I think that would um, tell us. But I think but, it just runs the model and then takes away the you know, whatever it is, the predicted minus the, um, the actual so value. It's so the predicted, my, I mean, the fitted minus observed, right? So that would give you your residuals. Yeah, I'm sure it just does something like that. I don't think there's much science, I mean, much interest there. But um, I don't, I don't remember uh, what the, what log looks, you know, what the, what log or price or carrot look like? Are they like skewed? Is that why he did them? Are they really skewed? I well, mean, it like yeah. carrot is really skewed based upon this um, plot that I see here, but I don't remember if price is. That's a good question. I wonder yeah. if I have that here somewhere. Um, I think you know that what? Could account for the log because you usually so. if you do, you have to assume some kind of normality if you do True. A, a linear model. But I yeah. don't remember off the top of my head what the price looked like. So I think, I think, I think, I think that the price is probably skewed, and that's why he did a log on that makes sense, the price. Yeah. and then. My guess is that, um, yeah, I don't know. I think that's that's a pretty safe guess to have. And then uh, it's interesting though, like I think uh, this is something that I would be really curious to try myself. Like, is there any difference between doing price and carrot and price and cut separately and then, or doing it this way where you plot them in a model together and then subtract them out? I don't know, you know, like, well, go to the second plot, if you don't mind, the box plots that you have there. So, I mean, my best guess, and this is, and, you know, please argue with me, I'm probably wrong, <laughs> is that this is the, res so if you take into account the carrot, right, because he was trying to figure out which way the causality went, is what it sounded like when you were describing it. Um, and so it looks like if you take into account the carrot um, and, and you remove that impact, what is the impact of the cut on the residuals? Um, yeah. And I would, I don't like, I mean, I'm just looking at this and realizing that I really like violin plots and not box plots. But um, true. Because I think it gives like a just, I don't like that there's all those points, you know, the, the one and a half standard deviations that go off. Cause I just like to look at a different way. Anyway, that's just my take. Yeah. Right, so I think I'm gonna have to do a little bit more research into add residuals and see what's going on here. I think basically the objective of this was to just see how you can see the impact of each variable on your outcome, how you can see the, how, how different variables, how they co your covariates, how if there's any covariation between them, which could impact the outcome. So that was the objective of this. I think he's given us a few techniques and methods to like tease them out. But uh, I don't know, I think this, um, yeah. 
just, I'm not Does not anyone sure. else have any feedback about what this plot could be useful for? Or am I the only one? Yeah, well, this one teased out the confounding factor of uh, carrot, because there, there's bigger diamonds at lower quality. And so when you look at price on uh, quality, the, the size, the carrot, was skewing the price, so it looked like your diamonds were less valuable. Oh, wait better. a minute, Eric, you actually said the right thing. Do you remember how Ideal had like the lowest price? Oh, wait, actually he's right. So do you guys recall, I think Eric got the, he hit upon it. So do you remember how like, uh, shoot, where was that? Uh, it was not color, it was cut. Where are you? Um, actually, actually, let me go back here. Sorry. So, uh, hang on. Carrot. Carrot. Cut. Color. Yeah, so cut. Remember how ideal was all the way here and there was, um, and then we are looking at price, of course. And then this was so confusing because we are like, how in heaven's name is uh, is ideal like so much lower and then you have you know all of this and the ones which are fair are but then did you see how that order has changed now so I just want you guys to remember this ideal very good good I mean and this is ordered so like I have done an order on this so it's ideal very good good premium and fair ideal very good good premium and fair ideal very good and look at this Ideal, very good, good, premium, and fair. So it definitely changed the ordering if, if you think about it. And again, this is ordered. So, wow, I didn't realize that until Eric said that. Yeah, so that's Eric, the benefit of um, doing the residuals. Eric, can you just say what you said again? Because I didn't, <laughs> I wanted to make sure I understood. Yeah, yeah, so like, um, when you look at the raw data, you see that um, I'm going to go back to that. Uh, green the box. median price for low quality diamonds is higher than the median price for high quality diamonds. And so you're like, what WTF? What's going on? And when like you this one here, Gwen. Yeah. So like I, ideal quality diamonds have an expected price that's lower than All right. Just for example. Right. And that, that's not that's nonsensical. It doesn't make sense. So there must be something confounding. Um, oh, right. Because so you're saying that they're OK. So yeah, so there's bigger diamonds. There's more bigger. There's there, there are bigger diamonds that are ideal. At, at low quality. Yeah. Right. And so because size is such a strong um, determinant of price, like the bigger the diamond, the higher the price. And because there's more diamonds, um, the average price for fair looks bigger, looks higher. Right. Right, right. Uh, once you, yeah. So once you run the model on carrot, you can see. Okay, now how? Uh, yeah. Carrot. So effectively, when you look at residuals, you're 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 holding carrot. Um, constant. Constant, exactly. Yeah. So you're able to say, okay, with carrot out of the picture, now what's my um, expected price based on um, quality of diamond, or or cut of diamond, as they. Because look here, Gwen, for carrot. Like they are, like you can see some of them, the ones which are higher, that have the higher carrot levels, they are like, obviously like this much more of them. So. And they're much more expensive. Yeah. And they're much more expensive too, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, and carrot and the X, Y, and Z, I think X, Y, and Z is like the length of the cuts. So they're very related as well. Correct. You see a bigger diamond has longer Cutting. But those those are probably like collinear though, right? Like I would imagine carrot and X, Y, and Z are probably collinear in nature. So that's that's not probably the greatest of relationships to to look for in terms of correlation because you know that they are going to track together. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But in terms of carrot and cut and price, which ones? Which how how do you remove that that confounding nature of that? That's that's interesting that is really interesting well good on you for observing that eric because that i totally lost like the i guess whatever like the final model of the story or whatever so <laughs> no i was just piggybacking on you and gwen actually well 
Well, thank you for giving us some credit. Yeah. <laughs> Even if we don't feel we deserve it. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Look at that. Like it's, it's, this is probably what you'd expect more of, right? Like it's, is it also true that because these numbers are so much here that that somehow changes something? Probably not, right? I, I don't think that that weight, that weight of that extra numbers could be changing anything, could it? It just means bigger diamonds sell more. Um, and then it's a question of where those, what quality. Um, yeah, we don't actually know the quality. Are, of and they're that. actually mostly um, poor quality. I wonder if we could have actually colored this by, I should have done something like that. I should have colored the, the carrot. You know what, that's what I should have done, you guys. I was just I about should, to like have that idea too. Oh right? <laughs> I should have colored it by, I mean, now that we kind of know where the story is tending, I know I'm reverse engineering it now that I already know what we, what the direction in which he's going, but one way to have teased that out is to actually color this by the cut, right? And then, yeah, that's right. So color it by the cut and then we know like, the ones which are more expensive, are they necessarily the ones which are like a better cut or like, you know, what's, what's going on there? Cause clearly this guy here, which is the high, highest carrot number has like the, the largest price, but what is the distribution of the various cuts here? Cause that would really get into like, like how, how much they are kind of, you know, tracking together. I'm going to try. And it's, it, gonna... it's also interesting just now noticing that it's one of the few um, boxes where the outliers for it are more below than above. Oh, good point. Good point, Luke. Good point. That's true. Wow. That's like, that's interesting. Yeah. But, but it's like, in fact, no outlier on the upper end. Like that's, that's like, wow. And that, that holds true in, in the other plot to the left as well. <laughs> they, you get well, that's true. That the outliers are at the bottom on the bigger, with yeah. the bigger carrots and they're oh mostly on the top not completely but mostly on the top for the smaller carrots yeah you know what we could do is that we could actually um i think it was a, who was it? um i think it's g galley or whatever like we could actually plot like color this i think i'm gonna i'm gonna try that and, and drop it in the group chat sometime this weekend because then it'll tell us like hey high price is that necessarily like a better cut or you know what i mean like it's I think um, there's, yeah, that's, that's interesting. That is really interesting. Like, I feel like these guys are probably just contributing to the noise, you know, like ultimately it feels like this guy is like triumphing over everyone else, like whoever, like whatever his distribution is, is probably calling the shots of uh, what that model ultimately ended up. Like, does that sound about right? Well, that's interesting. I'm gonna try and color it, and I'll um, I'll drop it in our uh, in our Slack channel. Well, that's all for me. I just realized in retrospect that I did not put enough text in here, so I apologize if I confused you guys. It looked really very skeleton-like. So sorry about that. I was trying to get my regular work done and do this at the same time. So sorry. That there there's no problem at all. We're we're all ungodly busy and some of us have tiny humans to also wrangle in the middle of all of it <laughs> so that's for sure the tiny humans will get you yeah for sure <laughs> well that's all for me you guys have a good night i i think i learned a lot from this um you learn more when you teach and that's certainly true for me yeah and the discussion really helped me like iron out a couple points too as well even if i wasn't as talkative yeah. because I had the world's loudest dog barking at somebody <laughs> outside the fence. And the one thing I've realized, especially, and like this, this dawned on me yesterday is that I've never given categorical, uh, categorical variables. Like I've never given them like their due. Like it's always been about like slope, da, 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 calculate this, move on. But I have never actually dwelled enough on continuous and how you tease those two apart. Like, so this is really teaching me to like, not just go after like that one slope that I might be after, but to look for other things, uh, you know, along the way. So I think it, it was a very valuable exercise for me. So I appreciate the opportunity and um, look forward to the next discussion. Thank you. Yeah. Have a good night.
Thanks, all. Have a great weekend. Yeah, have a great week, and see everybody next week. Bye.